everyone, welcome to another episode of High Stakes with Steve Rosenberg. This is where we talk about real life, real business, and more importantly, real situations. Now, I love bringing on all the different kinds of guests that you've already been able to listen to or watch, uh, depending on what medium you're using. And I, I think it's just so important to understand how people of so many different walks of life, different uh, income levels, different influence levels, all get through and create their own business model that's successful for not only for them, but for other people to replicate and to duplicate. So if you haven't had a chance, make sure you go back, watch some of the other episodes of some of the other guests that I've had, and please make sure that you share out this video and other videos, like, comment, subscribe, you know, the standard drill, just watch it and share it. It's very simple, right? It's not complicated. Uh, today I have a very special guest, someone that, uh, is very, uh, her industry that she's in is very near and dear to my heart, uh, because this is the industry that I came from, which is real estate. And this lady is just a rock star. When I was introduced to her from a mutual friend, I thought I've got to have her on and I've got to talk to her about how she runs her life very successfully, her business and her influence business of being a, a national speaker and traveling and influencing people to do what she does on a much higher level. So Lee Brown, thank you so much for being a guest today on my show. Well, thank you for having me. It's definitely an honor to join the lineup of past guests you've had. My goodness. Well, listen, you are right up there with them. Don't kid yourself. So I, I know that you're downplaying who you are and what you do. Uh, just for our, our listeners, could you give us just a quick, you know, maybe two, three minute bio of you, who you are? Uh, where you came from? That's impossible, but I'll talk as quickly <laughs> as I can. I am the child of a realtor, the grandchild of a custom home builder, and I grew up on a farm. That is right here in North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte in Concord, which is the home of the Charlotte Motor Speedway and the new home of Red Bull. They just moved to Concord, nice. which is really exciting. I became a realtor 22 years ago after a stint as a saleswoman for Husqvarna, which is premium chainsaws, weed trimmers, and lawnmowers. Prior to that, I was a stockbroker, and I lived in Manhattan and used to have cocktails at Windows on the World, which now young people will never, ever know what that reference means. Makes my heart sad. And in the 22 years I've been a realtor, I've sold around 4,000 properties. I have my own brokerage. I have a team. And about 12 years ago, I became an instructor and a speaker helping educate people inside the profession about how to conduct real estate more professionally and more profitably. And also, I am a political nerd. I've run for office twice. Spoiler alert, I've lost both times. But I use those connections to help further the policy actions of realtors and private property rights here in the greatest country on earth. And there's so much work to be done in that space that I do all of those things. And I also have two teenagers, a husband, and we just added a whole flock of chickens, which is why there's chickens on the wall behind me. So I'm now the chicken farmer here in the neighborhood. Okay, there, you're right. You couldn't do that in two to three minutes, but you did a great job. And I wanna unpack this a little bit, if that's okay. Uh, first of all, let me just say that everything you're doing is, it, it, it is amazing. And I think you know it's amazing and you downplay it, which I appreciate. I love the political side. And I want to talk about that after this, because I, I love having people that are patriotic. Can I, we take the gloves off, though, when we talk politics? Oh, you, we can do whatever you want. This is your day. So whatever you want to do, we can do. But my whole thing is, is I've had on, you know, Navy SEALs, Green Berets. I just, I love, I, I live in Texas, right? So Texas is, uh, to me, well, I don't want to say the most patriotic state because that would not be correct, but I think it's a very patriotic state. I love it. I love the people. I love what everyone stands for. And, and we'll have a, a deep conversation on a quick side note. My son is actually going to school at the NASCAR uh, Universal Technical Institute for uh, learning how to machine on engines. So I will actually be out there. I believe it's in Morsehead off of Charlotte. So if I'm out there, I'll have to let you know. We can hook up. Yes, that's right near uh, Dale Earnhardt's old shop, which his wife, Teresa, now runs or his widow. Yes. Yeah. So I, I'll uh, if, if me and my family come to town, I'll definitely let you know. Uh, OK, so let, let's unpack this a little bit because I, I want to we'll leave politics towards the end because I do want to dig into that. But I think to say that you are a driven person is probably a safe statement. Would you agree with that? 
Well, what else are you going to do with your days, right? Get up and wander around and act like a bowl of jello. You got to have something that you're chasing. And I think drive is just figuring out what you're chasing and, and doing the necessary actions. Okay. You make so, it have to be a little more, it's difficult than it is. So let me ask you this. Do you do you do what you do? Everything that you've had, you've had a past life in, in another kind of sales. Now, obviously you've conquered this world. Do you do it to be better? Or do you do it not to be worse? <laughs> wow, that's a good question. So I think I do it because I have to maintain my status as the best. And if you do not maintain, somebody else will take over that slot and your skills just diminish over time. It's no different than middle age. Your eyesight diminishes over time. And the only thing you can do about it is get reading glasses or get contacts and figure out what you can do next. And it's the same thing in real estate. I continue chasing the political and the educational side because, frankly, as a very successful practitioner, I got bored with listing and selling houses. And that's not a denigrating comment to those who do this for decades and love it. I feel them. I'm just wired differently. I came in, kicked it out. I love doing it. I'm good at it, but I had to move to something else. And so I guess it's a mixture of both. So let me ask you this. Uh, sometimes people, when they get successful and they get success. I, I think people get complacent, right? They get lazy and they get comfortable, which we all know is a dangerous place to be when you're an entrepreneur, because that's when life comes and punches you in the face as hard as you can. And you're like, holy moly, I didn't realize that was coming. How you're obviously at the top of your game. You've done very well. How do you keep that edge? Is it, you keep going into other arenas, like, like bringing in politics and growing or what, what drives you to do that? Well, I've always been active in the political side and I've always been paying attention to that, but I can spend more time on it now because I've been successful in my professional life because you, at some point, you have to trade your dollars and your time for each other. You're not ever going to make more time. And if you have enough financial stability, then your time can be spent on other things. And as a good friend of mine likes to say, sometimes you have to stop making money to make money. And for me, it's sometimes you have to stop making money to make a bigger impact. And of course, and I've built a wonderful passive stream and I can hear the comments now, you don't have to stop making money, but you have to understand there's always a trade-off, right? And so that's where I am in my professional life. But what I've done, like since COVID started and all these insane, stupid, ridiculous lockdowns, I got stuck at home. All of my speaking engagements canceled, all of my travel canceled. I could go back and sell houses and I did because I needed something to fill my days with. But then I made the decision to go learn multifamily because I had not done nearly enough of it. Dove in, learned that side. Right now I'm all in learning about land sales and I'm expanding my real knowledge, my practitioner knowledge, because why not? I mean, you're gonna figure out where you're gonna make money and have impact. And I'm looking for where those roads converge, Steve. And so I'm looking at more land sales means more contact with developers, which are definitely more politically involved than your normal Joe homeowner. Okay. So let me ask you this, as you're going through this trajectory, right? And, and I'll, let me back up. I, I'm going to give you my thoughts on how we live our lives. And you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, I am a big believer that our lives are a book. And there are chapters in our lives. High school is a chapter, college, our 20s are a chapter, 30s, and, and so on and so forth. And chapters are, some are long, some are short. I think some are good and some are bad, right? And I think a lot of people have the misconception that a chapter in your life has to be bad in order to close that chapter. I don't agree with that. I think a chapter, you can leave a chapter on a high. You can take some of the good from that chapter of your life and bring it into the next which it sounds like that's what you're doing. And you've, you seem like you're, you're pretty solid in being able to shut off those chapters, whether it was from the prior sales, living in Manhattan, to being a realtor, to doing you know, other things that you're doing, you seem like you're able to compartmentalize that to keep going. Is that a safe statement? I think that's a great way to put it. And I look at it as well. When you've written that chapter, there's no reason you can't let other people read it. So I take all of my success from residential real estate and I want to pour that back into the agents that work at my office, the people who call me and need to buy or sell. I can connect them to somebody that will do an amazing job, but that's not where my highest and best use is right now. 
And the other good thing about that chapter, once it's been written is after you close it, it doesn't mean you set it on fire. You print a million copies and let other people have access to it because that's attitude of abundance. Why not build other people up with what you learned before you moved on? Because I've been learning from successful people as I learn new endeavors. I have to pay that forward with other people that want to have the success that I've had. But, and I'm a big believer that success and successful people leave a recipe, they leave a trail. And we don't look, everything that you do, everything that I do, it's not new, right? We're not, we're not inventing the wheel, right? People have been successful in your world, in my world for many, many years before us. And it will continue if we leave a trail for other people. And I think that in a chapter, certain chapters in our lives, maybe yourself, I know mine for sure, you go from, I don't want to say taking, because that's probably not the right terminology, but you go from being someone who's trying to build a business, grow, scale, and, you know, we're in the trenches, and, you know, I built, scaled, and I eventually sold a, a very successful company, but then you go to helping and educating and paying back, and I, I think that there's a, I don't know if it's a transition, but I know that I got to a point of saying, you know what, I want to be the best I can be by giving back to people and helping, because, I've invested a lot in myself. Uh, I've learned from many people. People helped me. Uh, and I want to be able to give that forward. Do you, do you agree with that sentiment of as you progress in your life? Well, I like how you reject the idea of taking, but there's, there's two ways to get the information. One is by taking. That's that person who wants to grab everything from you, pick your brain, which I think is the worst phrase ever invented, suck everything out of you for their own purposes. But that same information, the person next to them is receiving it. They're open to it. They're grabbing the idea and saying, oh my gosh, thank you. This is helping me so much. And then they're going to utilize it. They're going to add their own flair to it. And then they're going to pass it forward. It's two people. The same information was provided to both one took and one received. And the one who receives turns out to be the one that winds up scaling and giving back. The one who took, let's be honest, they're not really happy people. The happy people you meet in life are looking to go expand and do and elevate. And the people who are just sitting over here clutching everything so tightly, they're so sad. Yeah. And that's not sustainable. And, and frankly, we only have so many minutes in life. Why are you going to waste any of them feeling that way? When the way you feel when you give that information that you received back to somebody else, they're like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. You're like, I know, right? And then you go watch them do something with it. That feeling can't be replicated. It's amazing. Yeah, a hundred percent. Now, let me ask you this. I want to talk a little bit about your brokerage that you have. You have you have agents that work underneath you. And for those of you that don't know, as a in the real estate world, you have a broker who's basically in charge and they have their agents that work underneath them. And, and essentially, at the end of the day, you are you are responsible for them. They are your your flock, your herd, the kittens that you have to herd around. Um, how do you impart that on them? Because obviously you get, and I know in the real estate world, you get all kinds of different people, which is fine, but how do you impart that abundance mindset to them? And what if they don't get it? Well, first of all, you get rid of them if they don't get it. There are so many places for a licensed person to land. And that's the beauty of real estate. It's wildly competitive. We have almost 1.6 million realtors in the country, not counting all the licensees who haven't joined the trade association and voluntarily decided to abide by the code of ethics. So 1.6 million agents and a ton of brokers. You have to decide as a broker, what's your culture going to be? My culture is one of abundance and sharing and leaning into each other. And we don't have to lock doors and we can pinch hit for each other. When somebody's got a kid homesick or they got a flat tire on their car, somebody will come in and help them even though they're not making any money on it. And that is something you set from the beginning of, this is how we're going to operate. The book by which we operate as a company is Excellence Wins, which is Horst Schultz book. Horst is of course the founder of the Ritz Carlton. And that's the story of how that hotel chain has really had a fantastic sustainable growth pattern over time. It's all about excellence. So we want that culture as a firm. And the way that I make sure my training goes out there is, first of all, my actions have to match my words. So I have to make sure that we're having team meetings and we're sharing information. And when news comes out, we give it. And then I record all my trainings, too. I have a whole video library because two different people who need information don't need it always on the same day. 
Right. It could be that they need this in a month and they're like, oh my gosh, I wish I had been listening, but I didn't need it then. Great. It's recorded. Go access it because I want you to have the access when you need it. And that's the beauty of technology. I mean, we forget sometimes that the little poisonous devices that suck up so much of our time and our bandwidth can be amazing time savers if they're utilized properly. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I'm a big believer in I, I refer to it as making a record, you know, you make a record one. Well, people probably don't know records, but we'll say a, an MP4 file. They can, Google it. they can Google it. Yeah. They can Google it. Uh, it's like a cassette tape and a pencil. Nobody knows what the correlation is except for I do, but anyways. Uh, so I think that, you know, that, that film it once have an FAQ, have a knowledge base library. I am a huge believer of that. And we, that's how we grew and scaled our company because you know, whenever somebody would not know how to how to answer a question or a certain situation, we'd say, go into the FAQ, knowledge base library, see if they have it. If they don't have it, I will make a video for it so we can answer your question. And that way it's done. You don't have to keep asking. And I, I'm a big believer that either someone is training you or you are training them. And if you are training them to always come to you for the problem slash solution, you're getting exactly what you wanted. And people always say like, oh, everybody takes my time. I'm like, they're not taking your time. You're giving your time because you have trained them to make it acceptable to talk to you. And I'm not, I'm not advocating not being a good leader and not listening, but there's a time and place. And many people do not understand the difference between leadership and management. And I think that's a, a big mistake that people believe that because they have their name on the door or because they're in charge, they think that they are the leader. And I tell them leadership is something that's earned. It's not something that you all of a sudden put your name on the door and poof, you're a leader. Um, just out of curiosity, though, from your, you deal with a lot of agents over the last many, many years. You're not necessarily from this industry, but but as you said, you're from a lineage of real estate. Why do you think, from a business perspective, right, and everybody has an opinion, why do you think realtors fail so much? It's a lack of understanding that they're running a small business. You go to the core of what this business looks like. People get into real estate because I love houses. I love people. I should be a realtor. I'll get paid all this great money. And they have this image of what television has told them, what the movies have told them. And sadly, what a lot of realtors have told them through their social post of, oh, look, I sold a million houses today. I'm bathing in money. And then they get into the business and they find out, well, uh, uh, I, I don't know what to do. They don't know the next step to take. They don't have systems. They don't have processes. And then they get a commission check and they think, oh, I just got $12,000. And what do they do? They spend $12,000 because they came from a corporate background where they had a W-2. And in real estate, most of us are 1099, which means you're responsible for your own FICA, your own taxes. And you got the self-employment tax unless you've turned into a small business entity. And all of these things add up. So a lot of new realtors wind up with tax bills to their state DOR and the IRS at the end of the year because it never occurred to them that the commission check was not theirs. And we can have a whole different discussion about how taxation is theft. But the reality is they've got a power over your ability to conduct business and you either play ball or you don't. So what I tell new realtors coming in is, first of all, you better have some money saved up because it's going to be a while before enough people trust you, especially in a market like this, where they're going to be willing to hand over the reins to you. And as you start to sell some properties, what are you going to do? Organize your money first. Then they don't know what to do with their database. Most realtors don't start developing a database until five years in. They're like, I, I, I can't, I, I don't know what happened to five years and they've lost all their phone numbers and all their emails because they're wildly disorganized. And so if you look at the attrition rate, 85% of people who become a realtor quit within the first two years. The attrition rate is insanely high and it's because they didn't have any idea how hard it was going to be, how much debt they were going to wind up in trying to market, trying to compete in a highly competitive market. The ones who make it through, though, they get to the five-year mark and say, "I need to, I need to, um, I need to be a CEO now." And then they're trying to figure out how they go back and hire some help, how they go back and create some systems, how they go back and buy a client relationship manager system, a CRM, and they're backtracking. So a new realtor out of the gate comes to me with a business plan, 
and has a spreadsheet of the way they're going to approach this, I'll hire them all day long. You know, it's it's funny you say that. When I was uh, when we had our property management company, I was uh, I was a CE certified uh, teacher, so I would teach realtors. And I would, you know, we were big into inbound marketing. And this is when CRMs were kind of coming into the thing. It was about mid 20, 2015, 2016. And my belief is information is the new gold, right? You've got it. You have digital information. You capture that information. You form strategic alliances. You create content marketing, all that stuff. And I would talk to these realtors and I would talk to them about marketing, which none of them really understood what that meant. Uh, but I would talk to them about, about marketing and how to grow their, 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 their brand, and I would ask them, how many people have a list? How many people have more than 100 people in their contacts? And of course, almost everybody would raise their hand in, in a classroom of maybe 50 people. And by the time I got to maybe 2,000 or 2,000 or 2,500 people in the database, because I'd have them keep raising their hand, there'd only be one or two people. And they've been agents for 20 years, right? And I, my, my, what I would say to them is I've been in business five years and I have 40,000 people in my database that I've organically captured. If I send out an email to 40,000 people that I have a property that I'm selling and you send out an email to 500 people, who do you think is going to get more traction from that? And when I start doing relationships and partnerships and I'm like, that is so essential. That's business 101. You've got to understand marketing to make your phone ring. And then you've got to understand how to convert them and operations and accounting now, I learned how to grow my business as a business owner, not as a property manager. And I would say that that was probably one of the biggest gifts I was given was learning how to actually run a business. So going back to what you said, 85% of all realtors do not renew after year two. Where is the failure? Where is the breakdown? And I don't, not to get into a, a blame game, but why are they not being taught and being giving them realistic expectations? Because people are maybe leaving their careers. Maybe they're fed up and they're running away from what they don't want. I get that. But isn't there a responsibility of someone? Now, I get they're adults and I'm not trying to, they need to be babied and coddled, but shouldn't someone tell them, listen, before you get into this world, you need X, Y, Z. And if so, who is that person? And why isn't that being taught on the early inbound stages? Because look, a real estate licensing school makes money with students in a real estate licensing class. So you want to break this down to what it actually is, which is free market capitalism. And I agree that somebody should be giving better information, but it's also on the person taking the class to do better research than just guessing that what they saw in American Beauty was an accurate portrayal of real estate. Now, I know a lot of good pre-licensing schools where the instructors do say, this is going to be hard. You're going to have a really hard time. Here's some ways to succeed. The question is, well, is it Confucius that said when the student is ready, the master will appear? And a lot of these folks aren't ready for it. I don't know that people actually leave a career to go strike off in real estate. What I find more often, and I've spoken around the world, is people leave their job because they're fed up and then they're like, I mean, I could do real estate. They kind of think of it as a why not kind of an option. It's not a dream pathway. They have this nebulous idea of something around real estate, but they haven't yet connected the dots. But the pre-licensing schools, that's the first method in. Now let's think about this. That's not just realtors. That's also real estate licensees. The state governments are involved in this too because they make money on every new license. They make money on every renewal fee. Every state too is counting real estate licenses as employed persons. And so if you reduce the number of licensees, you might actually move your unemployment by a, a, a percentage of a point. There's no politician in office on either side of the aisle that is willing to move the needle on unemployment at all. And so they just have this financial reward from running as many licenses through the system as they can because it's a revenue stream for the state. So you got to remember your state elected officials are part of this through their licensing entities. The pre-licensing schools have a reason to have new licenses come in. The trade associations benefit when somebody goes from a licensee to a realtor, they're going to pay membership dues. So all of these people are involved and all of those entities along the way do offer information about succeeding as a realtor. Most humans out there are going to ignore that. 
because we're looking for positive affirmation. They would rather be told, yes, honey, you can make 100,000 in your first year. I believe in you. People will organically lean towards that because it feels good instead of the person that says, you might want to think twice about this. This business is hard as shit. And they don't want to hear that. So is it, I guess, on, on two factors, I, what you said, the way I interpreted it is number one, it is a, it's, a, it's a business model for the state for revenue. It's a revenue generator for the state, for each state. And it's a play on the person's greed to they want to hear you're going to be a rock star. If they talk to you and you're like, look, you need to create a business, a business plan. They're going to go, she's too negative. I wouldn't, I don't want to work with her. I'm just not going to she's listen to her. trying to protect her business. She yeah. doesn't want me to come in and up. No, that's not it. I want exactly. you to succeed, but I want you to succeed correctly. Yeah. So let me ask you this. And, and I, I say this lightly. Uh, what part of the industry of real estate do you hate? And I, I hate I hate to say use the word hate, but what part do you really dislike about real estate? Is it the politics involved? Is it the the misinformation? Is it the the illusion when people are on buying sprees and you know maybe they're setting themselves up for disaster down the road? What part of it? It's overregulation, and that's not coming from the real estate profession as much as it's coming from elected officials on all three levels of government. Whether you're talking local, municipal, state level, or in federal government up in DC. And most of the regulatory crap is coming from bureaucrats. It's not even coming from elected officials. It's coming from these lifelong leeches on the system who see a chance to make extra money with a permit fee here and an environmental overlay there, and then an extra tax over here. And now we're going to tell you what you can and can't build. You talk about the erosion of property rights is what I can't stand about what's happening in real estate, where I live on 10 acres, all right? And it's a river on my property. There's a little bit of floodplain down around the river. Who designed that? FEMA did. Has it ever flooded? No. Does FEMA ever know where my property is? No. They just said, now let's draw a map right here. Shazam, now you owe us some flood insurance money. I right. So I had to demo the pool that was here before. When I went to get the permit, because I have to get a permit on my property of 10 acres. Why do I have to have a permit when I live on 10 acres? to take out the old pool, which was cracked and put in a new one, I had to fight tooth and nail because this much literally of the corner of my pool decking is in the flood zone. They said I shouldn't have a pool in the flood zone. I said, y'all know how water works. I don't reckon this is as big a problem as y'all are making it out to be. And when people encounter that, their frustration gets really high. I mean, look at what's happening right now. The mayor of Miami has declared an emergency, a state of emergency over housing. Why do they do that? It's so they can go in and tell you what you can and can't build on different lots and in different neighborhoods. I'm, a, I'm opposed to that. I think the free market will organically fill its gaps if left alone. There's enough issues in development right now with the supply chain, how it's impacting the cost of materials, the labor costs that are out there. And when you go telling somebody you have to build this, you have to build that, that's a disincentive to add rooftops. And how many developers right now have said screw it and thrown their hands up? Right. And it's not making our problems any better. So, yeah, I can go about that for days, but it drives me crazy. Yeah. And in fact, I'll point one more thing out. The hedge funds right now are buying so much residential property because there's a great return on investment right now. The numbers work. Right. The knee-jerk reaction of a lot of people is regulate them, tell them they can't buy it. I'm like, there's got to be a solution created by the market that isn't a regulatory overbearing, and I can't deal with that. But I, I have issues with the hedge funds and I don't know the solution right now, except that they probably need to be broken up. BlackRock, State Street and Vanguard are at the core of what's wrong right now in our system with this ESG nonsense and it's getting worse every day. Well, and I think, you know, to, to your point, it, whether it's the hedge funds or whoever it is, careful what you ask for. You bring in that regulation and all of a sudden you're like, oh, that wasn't for me. That was to regulate them. That was for I, them. Yeah, I want to do what I want. And it's like, oh, no, no. This income, you know, when, when it does that sweep, it sweeps everybody. So, I, you know, I'm a big believer as you are. Careful what you ask for because you may get it and it may not be interpreted the re end result of what you thought it was going to be. And I, I'll give you a quick example. I remember when I was buying some real estate in uh, in the Houston area, I owned a bunch of properties in a certain a certain subdivision area and we get to the closing table and they're like you need flood insurance. I'm like flood insurance. I'm like 
we own five properties on the next street over. We don't have flood insurance on that. They're like, yeah, it's every other street requires flood insurance. I'm like, that yeah, makes cool. I'm like that. That makes no sense. I'm like, that's not even logic. I can't even have a logical conversation about that. And their answer is, is, well, that's just how it is. I'm like, that's not acceptable. I don't agree with that answer. Like every other street, like anyways. So that's, yeah, I, I just don't that get that. that the rationale. Flood waters in Houston are so smart. They only know to go to certain streets, just <laughs> like the COVID is so smart. It only attacks certain people in certain situations. If you're standing uh, that, that'll get you. If you're standing, if you're sitting, you're fine. If you're sitting at a table, you're anyways. Okay. We can get in that in a minute. Um, okay. So let me ask you this. Someone like you, you're very successful. Obviously you, you've done a lot of different ventures. How do you keep driving so that you don't get to the point of, you know, I've, I've had the, the fortune of talking with astronauts and Olympic athletes, and they both say that there's a very high rate of depression for people that actually achieve the pinnacle of their life. Their, you know, astronaut goes to the moon, um, uh, Olympic athlete wins a gold medal, and then they're done. They, they can't go back to that. How, how do you keep that drive with your success? Do you, do you tack on another, you know, you're speaking, you own the brokerage. Do you tack on more? Do you give back? How do you balance that so you don't have your, you know, lunar landing and then you're depressed? Well, first of all, it is not big pharma. And I'm very concerned about how so many people, when they hit that moment, are seeking a pill to yeah. fix how they feel. That's, first of all, never going to happen in my life. I'm going to figure out what is on the other side of that doorway. And is it something bigger in the space that I'm in? Should I continue mining the honey hole I'm in? I started writing books in 2016. I've written four books now. And that's part of me figuring out a different way to give back, a different way to reach an audience. Speaking is definitely a growth space for me. And I enjoy that rush so much. As long as people are with me in the room, when they put their devices down and hang with me, there's no rush bigger than that. And it's always fulfilling, even in a room of 10 people, because if somebody comes up at the end and says that impacted me, then that is infinitely scalable. And you start seeing it with people like a Zig Ziglar who was able to teach and speak for his entire life. And it never stops being fulfilling because somebody out there is getting fed. So that's in my professional side, but I do focus heavily on the give back side. And the interesting thing about hitting a level in your professional life that is way far beyond what you ever envisioned if you're paying attention, it will impact other places that were completely unexpected. I've done political fundraising for several years for the realtors, and that's now one of my skills. Never would have envisioned that I would have that skill because I'm an introvert by nature and grew up poor on a farm. So money is definitely a, a hang up that I have to go ask people for money. If you'd asked me 20 years ago, it would never have happened. Now I'm skilled at it. Well, my church is in the middle of a capital campaign to expand our facilities because we are busting at the seams. So now I have this, wow, I have training that I never expected to have to apply it in a place where I never knew it would be needed. You just have to find ways to scale and you do it by keeping your eyes open and your face up out of your device and being busy in the world, meeting people and finding out what their challenges are and asking them if they want you to help solve it or if you just want them to listen. I mean, there's so many opportunities out there. Ugh, there's no reason to quit. You know, the, the, the simplistic analogy that I use, I, I, that I say is a shark is always swimming. They're not swimming to a destination. They're just always swimming. And so I tell people, you know, with my life and accomplishments that I had, have had and where I'm going in my life, I just say, I'm just, I'm swimming. I'm, this is, this is me. It's not what the destination. It's the journey. And I, I want to keep swimming. I don't want to hit, I don't want to hit, you know, South America, North pole. I just want to keep swimming. And if I keep swimming, I'll keep breathing and I'll keep being happy. Sharks happiest when they're swimming. It's what they do. And so that's, that's kind of the analogy that I use when it comes to people asking me where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do. So I love yours. Cause I think it's great. Um, all right. Real quick, I want to I want to touch on your political perspective on some things and how it has affected the real estate industry and more importantly your business, either good or bad. So what is your take on everything going on right now? I have so many concerns about what's going on right now and it's not necessarily about the person who is in front of the camera and I think this is a mistake a lot of people make when they're looking at politics. The person in front of the camera 
is going to make you feel on this side or this side. They're designed to be polarizing right now. I don't care that, well, I do care. I think it's elder abuse, what's happening to Joe Biden right now. It's, it's inconscionable. But he's not the main problem. The problem is the support team around him and their viewpoints on things. And we need to be paying better attention to the entire team. And you see this in your professional life too, the person at the front. Well, think about Shark Tank, right? How many times have they told an entrepreneur, we really like you, but if you get hit by a bus, the business is gone. I look at politics the same way. I got to know who the team is because if something happens to President Biden, the policies aren't going to change. And we as voters did not ask enough questions. Well, some of us didn't ask enough questions about who was in the background. So I look at it in that way, and it means I'm looking at politics holistically. I want to look at policies that nobody else is paying attention to. I do read the white papers. I read the information because I have a responsibility to this country, to my kids, to my profession, to ask questions and pay attention. And what that does for my business is one of two things. I'm out of the closet as a conservative. That's no secret to anybody because I've run for office twice and you're going to have a letter by your name, which means some people by that letter are going to make decisions about you. Okay, well, that's on them. That's not on me. If they choose to judge me without having met me, that's on them. I can't control that. I'm done. The other side might love me without asking any questions and without knowing what I think because I'm not the exact opposite. I mean, I'm not the exact copy of anybody's beliefs. I am a wild array of things because I've been formed by a lot of people, by a lot of faith time, by a lot of time with God, by my kids, by my community. Man, I am very uniquely made. It means some people won't use me as their realtor. I'm okay with that because in a wildly competitive business, there's somebody else that they love. But there's a whole lot of people that are drawn to me because they say, well, thank you. At least we know what you think and who you are. And you're not trying to be something for everybody, which is completely malleable and a shapeshifter. I, I don't want to be known as a shapeshifter. I want to be known as somebody who pays attention, asks questions, but is not so set in concrete that I can't be open to, oh, I didn't think about that before. And so I pride myself on being surrounded by people different than me so I can hear them. They might be wrong. They might be right. They might be some mixture, but my job as a human is to honor who they are and then listen. Let me ask you this though. 20 years ago, I would say maybe 20 years ago, if you were hired for someone that was doing a job for me as a realtor, I would care less. And I, I still would, but about your political affiliation. Why is that so important now that someone's going to make a business decision on something on your political thoughts and, and actions? I don't understand why is that? A, personally, I don't understand why that's okay for someone to make that decision. Obviously, we can't decide what people do or don't do. I'm sure it's the social media and all that stuff. But I just, I have a hard time thinking, why is that even okay in the conversation to even bring that up? If you're male, female, black, white, yellow, I don't care. Can you do the job that it takes to get this across the goal line to put it in the win column? If the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, then I'm not hiring you. When did that change that made it acceptable for people to put their own opinion on your skill set? I think it's social media. Frankly, I think social media is the biggest poison we've ever seen in our society. It is controlled information by tech oligarchs who are not accountable to anyone. I mean, you want to talk about the support teams of unelected people. That's all of these tech oligarchs. And it's crazy because you just look back to before social media, your grandparents were probably like mine. They believed in the privacy of the voting booth. Right. And that's how I was raised. There is a privacy of the voting booth. Now, my grandparents pulled the lever for their party. My grandmother was a Republican. My grandfather was a Southern Democrat. They wouldn't even ride to the polls together, which was hilarious, but they both went to vote so they could cancel each other out. It was like the perfect way to grow up in politics, sure. but that was a family joke. It wasn't something that everybody knew about, but with social media, it became something to lay down your gauntlet for and I don't know how we come back out of that, Stephen. It's kind of crazy that people use that as a defining decision factor. Just like, I, I don't need to know who somebody's sleeping with. I want to know the character of their brain and the character of their heart and why we're making immutable characteristics or their personal life something to decide who we do and don't work with makes no sense to me.
But here we are. And so I will say this, I won't hide what I believe. If the world wants to say that you must say this one talking point and you must be in this vein, I will not unless I agree with it. So that means by nature, I'm a little bit out there when it comes to this because so many realtors are panicked over the idea of losing a piece of business if somebody finds out that they disagree about something. And to me, that's a sad way to live. Well, you more, let people know who you are. And more importantly, what does that say about you and what you're willing to stand for? I Look, I, and I, I could care less what someone's political. I've got my own beliefs. You have yours. Everyone has theirs. And you know right. what, what? If we align, that's great. If we don't align, we agree to disagree or whatever. Here. I'm still good there. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, why would I run my life being afraid like of what people are like? I can't post this. I can't just... I could care less if you don't like me. I'd rather, let's just get it out in the open. Like I don't, I don't care. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be afraid to talk about something in in a conversation because I'm in a certain mar. And I travel the world as as you do, and I'm in multiple cities. And I just think to myself, why is that okay? That if I believe a certain way, I need to cower down and be afraid of it because other people don't approve. But if it's tables are turned, it's not okay. I just, I don't, I don't understand that one way thinking. We shouldn't be empowering bullies. And that's what's happening right now is that you say something that someone else disagrees with and they feel it's their obligation to come yell at you, right. but not in person. It's behind a keyboard, these keyboard warriors. And that's why I blame social media and the internet. People say things behind their online profile. They never say to your face. Yeah. And honestly, if, if we would shut down all those platforms for 90 days, I think it would be amazing how people would learn how to get along together. In fact, the beginning of COVID, March of 2020, I think people got along very well for a minute because the government policies sent everybody home and suddenly they were talking to their neighbors again. And yeah. that's before we started fighting over masks and fighting over vaccines and all of these artificial divisions were cast among us. But for a minute there, we showed you could actually pull together. And that does give me hope because like you, I don't, I don't need to agree with other people. I just need to see them for who they are and then let them see my chickens because chickens are the great connective force as it turns out. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I've got two last questions for you and this has been a great show. So I really appreciate it. I got two questions. First question is, is when you're done and you're sunsetting with your husband and your kids and you're retired and you're sitting on your farm, what do you most want to be known for? Like when people mention your name, what do you want that to be followed with? I want them to say she noticed me and believed in me when nobody else did. And it's part of why my favorite project professionally, and I started this four years ago, I started speaker boot camps where I'm teaching other people how to come take the stage. How do you build your presentation? How do you sell your presentation? How do you go get behind the microphone? I love watching they're my babies. I'm their mama hen. I love watching them grow. And so many of them will tell me, I, I can't believe you believed in me. I love this. I, I love believing in people. I want to be the old person that somebody comes by and says, you believed in me a long time ago because somebody believed in me and he's dead now. And if he was alive, he'd be so proud because I never saw my talents and he saw it so fast. And that's who I want to be. I love it. That's uh, very powerful. All right, last question. If you could have a conversation and a, a drink, whether it's whiskey, wine, beer, coffee, soda, whatever, whatever your flavor is, dead or alive, real or imaginary, who do you think that person would be and what would you talk to them about? Oh, who would, oh, see, I, I answer this question differently every time I'm asked because I read a lot. I love books. Right now, I want to sit down with Ayn Rand. She wrote The Fountainhead. She wrote Atlas Shrugged. She was a Russian emigre. She basically foreshadowed everything that's happening in our governments and our societal systems right now. I want to sit down with her and ask her how she took her experience as a young person in Tsarist Russia who went through that Russian revolution immigrates to the U.S. and then foresees a future, develops her own philosophy called objectivism. I'm fascinated by what she wrote, a little bit disturbed, but nine times out of 10, 
I would love to hear her viewpoint. And I've watched some of her interviews from like the 50s, but that's who I would sit down and drink a bourbon with. And I'm pretty sure she probably only drank coffee. She doesn't seem like the drinking type in my guess. You never know. You never know. Well, Lee Brown, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time, educating our listeners and very fascinating again. And we didn't even dive too much into the real estate because I wanted to keep it more at the business level. I'm sure we could have a whole real estate conversation uh, in that whole realm because I'm very uh, well-versed in that. But if people want to find you, learn more about your speaker uh, boot camps and everything else that you do, where would you send them? LeeBrown.com. And you can also connect to all my social networks there. That's your easiest location. And by the way, if y'all share this episode a bunch and give a whole bunch of five stars and subscriptions and comments, then Stephen will know to have me back. So that's how you're going to signal to him that I should come back again is by sharing the episode and telling your friends to come give a listen to High Stakes over here. 100%. Absolutely. And we will have the uh, notes in the show notes, all of her information, bio and everything that you need. And definitely I would recommend if you have an event and you need a speaker, she would be the first person on my list that I would be calling. So definitely get a hold of her and we may see her in the uh, political arena soon. You never know, you know, this world is, has a very interesting twists and turns. I'd love to see it. Well, we'll, we'll see. I I will know when the time is right and it hasn't appeared yet. So when the student is ready, the master will appear, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Lee Brown, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day, being on my show. And for all the listeners, thank you for watching another episode of High Stakes with Steve Rosenberg, where we talk about real life, real business, and real situations. Please make sure that you like, comment, subscribe, and share this out to everybody. Make sure they're all getting educated because you have a responsibility to make sure that you're helping other people. Don't just keep it to yourself. So on behalf of Lee and myself, thank you very much. And we will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.